Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Donahoe. Welcome to the Well Standard Podcast. This is episode 10 of season two, where we are talking about the principle of liberty and wanted to wish everyone a happy Independence Day. And I have a guest that uh, that I saved just for uh, just for this week. And her name is Kristen Tate. She is a contributor on a lot of different news networks. Uh, she is a columnist for The Hill, uh, The Washington Times. You see her on Fox often and, uh, and other uh, business and news channels. Anyway, it's a fascinating interview. She, uh, she has two books out. The first book she wrote a few years ago is called uh, Government Gone Wild. And her latest book, which is titled How Do I Tax Thee? A field guide to the great American ripoff. Talking about taxes, uh, it's a, it's a, it's good. And, and I've, you know, the interview is uh, is interesting because some of the points that I brought up, which you'll see in just a moment, uh, she she has a really good insight into just the the principle of tax and what we can do about it. And we get into a lot of details in regards to uh, the local tax system, and uh, where potentially people have more uh, more influence. It was an energetic interview, to, to say the least. You guys are going to really love Kristen. All right, so the book, uh, just a couple more weeks to the book releases. If you guys are new listeners or are not on our email list, go over to thewellstandard.com and uh, subscribe because we're going to have some special uh, things we're going to give out uh, just to our podcast audience. Uh, so make sure you guys are on that list. The slated date of the release is the week of July 23rd. So the book, Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, A Financial Strategy to Reignite the American Dream, is finally done. It is, uh, it's taken a long time, but it's finally, uh, finally done. Okay, that's it, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, listening again. And here is my interview with Kristen Tate. Welcome to the 2018 seasons of the Wealth Standard Podcast. Celebrating life, liberty, and property. You are listening to Liberty Season 2. Okay, Kristen, it's awesome to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for, for your time. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to talk about your, uh, your, your new book. Thank you so much for having me on the show. All right. So Kristen, you know, we had a little bit of a discussion before, before we, uh, before we recorded. So you're, you know, you're, uh, you're from the East coast, you're in New York right now. Uh, you know, I, I talked on the uh, intro about some of your accolades and now you've written, you know, a book that is uh, a pretty, I would say it's a bold, a bold statement. So why don't you, you know, maybe give us uh, and the listeners the your, your backstory, how you you know arrived at this you know a libertarian perspective that uh, that you that you have, uh, and then what was one of those those things that compelled you to write a book on taxes? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so I grew up in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. And uh, my father is kind of a uh, nomad. He hates the government, and he tried to raise me and my brother uh, as, as far away from government regulation as possible. <laughs> so, um, you know, he, he did everything possible to kind of get us off the grid. We didn't even have cable growing up or anything like that. So I grew up uh, relatively disconnected from the craziness of our metropolitan cities and even from politics really and the mindset where i grew up in my family was you know if you want something you work for it nothing is handed to you and i got through high school i went to a very small high school and i went off to college in boston which is a very big city for me at the time and i was kind of shell-shocked when i got there because the mindset of the students that I encountered was very much um, an entitlement mindset. And, uh, you know, they all expected something for nothing and didn't really know a lot about fiscal policies. You know, of course, all of the, the students I encountered had very strong opinions when it came to social issues like gay marriage and abortion, but didn't really seem to have any opinions or knowledge about taxation or uh, anything really related to fiscal policy at all. So that always sort of bothered me going through college, but I never really thought I'd make a career out of politics. But that all changed when uh, I got an internship working for John Stossel at the Fox Business Network, and oh, he kind of took awesome. me under his wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
I grew up, again, not really having cable. So I didn't really get into to Stossel or his work till I got in, into college. But he kind of took me under his wing and opened up this whole world of, of libertarian media to me, which was just fascinating. And Stossel, I always say, I think is the last real journalist. You know, he didn't just read teleprompters. This is a guy who does all his research himself and really puts together real high quality pieces of work mm -hmm. to get his libertarian points across. So I was lucky enough to be trained by him. And that's kind of when I decided I wanted to get into this space. But what really bothered me again was, was seeing my generation not really know anything about fiscal issues. So I thought, what can I do to make ideas like taxation and unfunded liabilities and that sort of thing palatable, interesting, and pertinent to young people? So that, that kind of drive to, to do that is what shaped all of my work over the past seven or eight years. I've written two books now. Um, I was a reporter for a long time. Now I'm an opinion columnist for The Hill, but the, the sort of main thread that ties all my work together is this desire to show young people why taxation matters, why government spending matters, why the national debt matters, why unfunded liabilities matter, and how those issues impact us each individually and our bottom line. So the intended audience is more of a younger generation, which I, you know, I think it's, I think it's interesting where, you know, you, you discussed how you developed your, your mindset toward, uh, you know, not necessarily anti-government, but, you know, the, the lack of it being needed for, you know, some of what most people consider it being needed for today. And, and then you, you know, you kind of went off and, and saw how, you know, the mindset of the real world has developed, right? Because those that were watching cable TV, those that were, you know, in more, you know, suburban uh, metro areas and how they developed their mindset, uh, there definitely is a disconnect. And the disconnect is people, I would say, uh, in large part, assume that uh, the proper role of government uh, isn't what, you know, was intended by by the, the founding, the founding fathers. So, when you look, you know, your first book, The Government Gone, Gone Wild book, and then now, uh, How Do I Tax Thee? With, with, these, with these books, did you have that, uh, that understanding in mind as far as, you know, the, the, how, how strong the mindsets are, especially of a young, this younger generation, how strong the mindsets were, and then, you know, really st uh, strategically went about, you know, framing your message in a way that would, uh, help them to, to think without putting up an immediate barrier. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would say that is something I kept in mind. You know, Patrick, what's really interesting is when you talk to the vast majority of young people, they'll immediately tell you that they're, they're liberal or they're Democrats. But when you actually start asking them about individual issues, you'll find out that they're mostly libertarians. You know, you talk to them about the social issues. Of course, they're all left-wingers on those. But when you really start asking them, well, do you think you get taxed too much? Of course, most of them say yes, assuming they have a job. You know, you say, um, well, do you, think, um, do you think you should be paying up to 50% of your income to the government? Most of them say no. And you start crying and kind of asking questions, and you realize a lot of young people are conservative when it comes to spending. They just don't know it. And they don't know it because most of them don't care about spending because they don't understand how it impacts their own wallets. But if you can show them that, they do start to care. And I think that's really how you create change and break through that barrier. And that, that's an, those are great. Those are great points. I think when it comes to one of the more personal things that people have to do with, it's their, you know, it is their money because that's a, a byproduct of, of them. It's the work that they put out there. And, you know, it's, it's just interesting where, you know, and I, I experienced this with, with kids recently uh, with my kids where, you know, they, when you earn something and you pay for, you know, you use what you've earned and pay for it. Uh, and then, you know, you, you treat it differently than if it was given to you. And I look at, you know, money that people are earning and, you know, it's a very personal issue. And so when it's being taken by those that didn't earn it, you have a very similar, very similar dynamic. And, uh, and I do believe that people, 
you know, really under fundamentally would, you know, they have libertarian leaning principles and, and, and values. It's just, you know, identifying with one group and another group. And, you know, that, that's kind of what messes things up every once in a while. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, another thing I, I encounter a lot when I talk to young people, especially when you talk to them about taxes, is they'll say, well, you know, I don't like taxes, but it's the cost of living in a civilized society. <laughs> but a lot of these young people have no idea that uh, I would say the vast majority of their tax dollars are being completely squandered by federal, state, and local government. Mm -hmm. So how do I tax the my latest book exposes all of these ways that we're getting taxed that we don't even know about, but also how that resulting revenue is spent. Mm -hmm. Because you can't really say that you're for or against taxes unless you know where that tax money is going. And uh, a lot of the time, really, the money is wasted. So what were, you know, and I assume that under the, the tutelage of, of, of Stossel and, and obviously with how you were raised, was there anything that surprised you in, in the research that you did in, a, in maybe a positive or negative way? Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about taxes and we have these national dialogues, the vast majority of the time we focus on income taxes or corporate taxes. Uh, but actually, when it comes down to individuals, income taxes make up less than half of our personal tax burdens. So that's really when I started digging, when I found that out, I wanted to find out all of the other ways governments are siphoning our money into, into coffers. So how do I tax these sort of exposes stealth taxes that are embedded into nearly every activity, uh, every bill we pay, every expense. So I'll just throw you some examples here. Uh, you know, cell phone bills, up to 30% of cell phone bills are, are just taxes. Uh, cab fares here in New York City are inflated by 25 to 35% due to taxes. Plane tickets, restaurant meals, uh, going for drinks at the bar, movie tickets, all of these things we do are inflated by stealth taxes that are beyond just sales taxes and often not itemized in our bills. And, and it really kind of threw me for a loop because as a conservative libertarian, I often complain about the federal government. But what I found when I researched this book that really surprised me is that a lot of these hidden taxes are being implemented on the state and local level. And again, the, the resulting revenue is often squandered. If you look at nearly any state or city budget, the number one budget item almost always is government pensions and salaries. And if you actually look at these salaries, they are wildly above market. And of course, same with the pensions. And uh, these people, these bureaucrats, just give themselves raises by implementing these sneaky taxes that they do not need to put up for a vote. Like again, the cell phone taxes. And it's just a way for them to generate revenue without political blowback. No, it, I mean, it, and, and obviously this week, you know, we had, uh, we had the Supreme, that Supreme Court ruling that, that now, you know, paves the way for the taxation of, uh, of online, online retailers. And it just, and it just continues on, it continues on. So maybe taking a step back, you know, looking at the, the understanding that people have of, of where tax dollars go, what are, what are some of the things you represented in the book as to where the money that, you know, is taken from us, right? Where, where does that money going and how is, you know, how, how is it, how is it being, being spent? Well, almost always the money is funneled into what is called the general fund. General funds can be spent any way that uh, whoever is running the city or state pleases. And again, if you look at budgets, it almost always goes to pensions and salaries. But here's what really bothers me, Patrick, is that these bureaucrats give these taxes important sounding names. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's something called a 911 fee. This is a fee that shows up in almost every American's cable, electric, and cell phone bill. I'm sure you've seen it itemized if you've ever looked at your bill. Mm -hmm. Well, if you see something called a 911 fee, you're not going to get very upset because you assume the revenue is going towards some sort of emergency service or 911 service. It used to, back when the fee was implemented in the late 1990s, it was a fee to generate revenue 
to update uh, the phone lines for 911 services. Well, the updates were completed in five to six years, and guess what? They kept those 911 fees in place. And now the revenue is just funneled into state general funds in nearly every state. So it's, it's things like this. They give these fees important sounding names, but really they're just taxes that go right into general funds where state lawmakers and bureaucrats can spend the money on whatever they want. So, yeah, and, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's widespread. You have kind of ridiculous ridiculous provisions and really every, every spending bill that they, uh, that they, that they come out with. Uh, but did you, did you dive into any of the, you know, just major type of earmark type of uh, spending pork spending and some of the, some of the examples there of where money is being used? Well, on the federal level, I mean, it's ridiculous. If you look at uh, even departments like the IRS, they're squandering money on things like, you know, conferences where they're spending nine dollars per cup of coffee. But with my tax book, again, most of these hidden taxes that I focused on are imposed by states and cities. So what the money is spent on really depends on where you're living. But again, it's mostly going to to government salaries. And, uh, you know, each government employee has an army of assistants, all of whom make above market salaries and pensions. That's really where the money is going. It's the way the money is collected that is ridiculous, surprising, Mm -hmm. and totally dishonest. Another example is um, pet licensing fees. Do you have have like a dog or a cat? Yeah. Yeah, so when you adopt a dog or a cat in most states, they charge something called a pet license fee. And of course, when when you do this, you assume the fee is going to something that helps dogs or cats. When in reality, it's, it's literally a financial penalty for adopting an animal in most states, and the money just goes to the city government. So this is just another example of one of the ways that you get kind of shaken down. Um, but my, my book also does explore different solutions. I mean, one of the good things about these hidden taxes is that, again, when they're implemented on the city level, they're easier to get rid of. Of course, a federal tax almost never goes away, but there are a lot of instances where citizens do find out about these stealth taxes. And uh, if you create enough noise and you live in a small to medium-sized town, it's easier to get taxes overturned. I mean, sometimes it's a matter of just showing up at a town hall meeting and, uh, I also show people ways they can kind of shift their spending habits to avoid some hidden taxes. But really, I mean, this is something that Americans need to be aware of because, uh, again, income taxes make up less than half of our personal tax burden. So I think we all need to be aware of the other ways that our money is being siphoned off into government coffers. So uh, well, I want to ask a question about, about monetary policy, then I then go to you know, something you mentioned in the beginning, which is our, our uh, unfunded, unfunded liabilities and what those are and what, you know, what, the, what the issues are. Then maybe we can, we can conclude with some uh, thing, things to do based on what you just, what you just said. So when the, the government just keeps printing and printing money, eventually money becomes worth less. And uh, I, I really think that right now, we're approaching a debt nightmare fast and a lot of young people just don't realize it or they simply don't care and they just kind of take for granted, oh, we live in in America, we're always going to be okay, we're always going to be a rich country. But the more money we continue to print and the more we spend without uh, collecting enough in taxes, the more or the less the value of a dollar is. And then we're getting there. It's, It's coming and it's coming fast, but a lot of young people remain completely clueless, which is why we need more people reaching out to my generation. And unfortunately, they're really not doing that in colleges today or high schools for that matter. I mean, I went to a liberal arts school. I never was even forced to take a basic finance class to get my bachelor's degree. It's ridiculous. They don't teach you anything about economic policy or basic finance. No, and that's it is it, it's it's scary how how few people really under understand it because you know the inflation idea that that alone people understand the word they hear the word being said but when it comes to actually dissecting it and 
and understanding what it is and what type of uh, destruction it has on on people's earnings, right? Then uh, you know, and again, it goes to government too because the governments are the ones that uh, that take advantage of you know the idea of being able to you know create debt, monetize the debt, and and spend money, which pushes more money into circulation. Now you have more money chasing uh, the same amount of goods, increasing prices. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where two to 3% may not sound, you know, like, like a lot, but compounding every single year, you know, it eats away at what people are, are earning. Okay. But that, that goes to, you know, a lot of the, the unfunded liabilities, social security, Medicare, uh, and obviously the budget, you know, budget deficits as well can be, can be added to that. Uh, what do you paint as a picture of the, of the future based on some of the research that you, that you did? Well, it, it's pretty terrifying. Uh, there's an economist who writes for Forbes who says that we have $210 trillion worth of liabilities that our government can't fulfill. And that's a way higher number than I've seen elsewhere. But it, it just proves the point that the government cannot fulfill its promises when it comes to these welfare programs like Social Security. I mean, I don't even think my generation will get the benefits of Social Security. It's going broke. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we have all of these obligations to federal workers who enjoy their cushy pensions and retire early. And uh, it's not sustainable. It's really not. I mean, there's six trillion dollars worth of liabilities just on the state and local level alone. Uh, so something's got to change. But again, the first step towards creating change is fighting apathy. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can really do that is breaking down these big mega issues into little bits mm -hmm. that really show people how taxation, how spending, how uh, all of these, these big policies that seem sort of absurd affect each one of us personally like I saw this uh, this poll the other day on Gallup that said Millennials think that they're going to retire or a majority of Millennials think they're going to retire at age 56 as millionaires <laughs> well guess what the average Millennial doesn't even have any savings they have zero dollars in savings for retirement the vast majority have nothing saved uh, so so there's clearly a cluelessness and the government's not going to be there to help us when, when my generation turns 56 and expects to retire yet has nothing in savings. <laughs> well, and this, and this presents, you know, kind of an ominous, uh, ominous issue, which, which is discussed, but, but maybe this is what you were alluding to with the, per, the, one of the, one of the purposes and intentions of, of your book, which is to bring, to bring awareness because I mean, the problem is so big. I mean, it, I mean, $210 trillion, if people understood what that represented, right? And, and then what it's going to take to actually pay that back, just to pay the interest on it, it, it they'll realize it's impossible. And then your mind goes to, okay, well, what's going to happen if, well, you know, once, you know, once the jury's out and that's where it's, that's where it's scary because, you know, if there's a you know, student loan, well, there's massive student loan default going on right now, but, you know, inevitably you're going to have some sort of bailout of that system but people, I don't know if, if most people understand the, you know, what that entails, what a bailout entails, which is, you know, creating more money and just exacerbating the, exacerbating the problem. Uh, but it comes down right. to, you know, they just Medicare think it's that uh, they're getting off for free. Like they're getting their, and they're uh, not, debt it's like totally not that's free. Great. It's actually worse. <laughs> it's, it's worse. Exactly. Than free. But, the, but you know, the, the social security, you know, the estimation just changed it. You know, you probably know about a month ago, to 2028, right? When it'll go, uh, go bankrupt. So reform has to happen. Uh, but here, but what's your take? I mean, what is your, I, I don't know if I have a, th a theory or an opinion here because I look at like the, how big the problem is, but yet are, are politicians just like, you know, are, are they just nefarious by, by nature or do, do they know what's going on? They're just trying to, you know, get to the, you know, get to their retirement without, you know, without being accountable to what's, to what's going on. I mean, what, what is your take based on what you've, you know, discovered and wrote about? I mean, what, what's your take about the politicians that are enabling, you know, just more and more, more and more tax and more and more spending? The problem is that politicians on both sides of the aisle won't do anything about this. Trump even ran on not reducing uh, social security. So, 
nobody wants to actually tackle this issue. And part of the problem is that it's not a winning campaign message to tell people, I want to take away your benefits. No one's going to vote for that. <laughs> it's very hard to make fiscal responsibility an exciting platform issue. Uh, very few politicians have done it successfully. I mean, you can see like Rand Paul has done it, Thomas Massey, a few others. But generally speaking, it's not something that's a winning issue on the campaign trail. Because again, it sounds very negative to tell large amounts of voters who rely on government handouts that you want to take their handouts away or downsize their handouts. Mm -hmm. That's part of the fundamental problem here. But it's bigger than just handouts. I mean, spending in general. Look at the omnibus bill that Donald Trump signed a few months ago. He, he uh, is spending more and approving more spending than Obama was. I mean, the tax cuts are great, but you can't implement tax cuts and increase spending. Mm -hmm. That's a recipe for disaster. So there's really nobody in Washington right now who's serious about spending cuts. And that's, I think, the biggest political scandal of our time. Do you think it's, do you think it is, do you think it's on purpose or do you think it's because they don't know what to do? I think it depends on the politician. I think yeah. Trump probably doesn't know. I think a lot of other Republicans are aware of this problem, but again, it's just kind of hard to rally support on spending cuts. It just sounds mean and cold hearted. So it's, it's really a big issue, and I don't know how it's going to be resolved. I actually don't think it will. I think this is going to get a lot worse. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, I, I, the conclusion I've seen most often is that, you know, it, it is going to be a, you know, essentially a, a, a systematic issue where, you know, there has to be, you know, ma major, major issues in reset. Anyway, I want to go off on that conjecture. Let, let, I... Go, let's go to solutions just because, you know, I, I would say one of, you know, one of the things that I'm excited about that, you know, you, you're writing about this is, is just awareness so that you increase awareness and you increase awareness, not from, you know, an adult telling someone younger what to do, but you're doing it on a peer-to-peer -peer level. Because I believe that the ability to influence uh, as far as generations are concerned, the most influence uh, is right now is coming from, you know, the, 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 you know, I would say the, the, back into the t uh, X generation, uh, as well as millennials. So what are, what are some of the things you, you uh, get people to, to think about, but also uh, do so that, you know, when there is, when there starts to be issues and, you know, the government steps in to, to rescue everyone, that there's enough awareness uh, so that we can have meaningful accountability. Right. Well, the first step is, again, just getting people aware of why this matters to them and making this a personal issue and, frankly, making it an emotional issue because it's very hard to get young people to even care about this when we have issues like, uh, you know, women's rights and gay rights and all these other social issues. They're so emotional. They're so easy to understand. They're so mm -hmm. easy to rally behind. We need to make fiscal issues have that same kind of tangibility. But beyond that, just on an individual level, what I tell young people is start saving now. Even if you only put away $100 per month or something, start a retirement account when you are young. Because I'll tell you, we're not going to have the same benefits that you know, older folks today have. We have to provide for ourselves and our own families. I also encourage young people to take some risks with their money and, and uh, invest in uh, currencies that are not the dollar. You know, I, I've experimented with uh, digital currencies, some of which blew up in my face and some of which have turned out well. But I think that these kinds of alternative currencies will only get bigger and more popular, especially as we see uh, inflation increase. So that's another thing that I tell people to do if they have enough money. But I think the big thing is, is saving consistently and starting as soon as possible. As soon as you get a job, start backing away money. And I've, you know, looking at some other things I've seen out there, because that's the first thing is, is be, you know, being aware, doing, doing what you can, but the, it, with the, with problems and challenges, I mean, that, that's where, you know, human beings shine, right? But oftentimes, you know, we try to steer clear of problems and challenges instead of tackling them. But looking at, you know, I would say the, the group that is going to 
uh, pay the biggest price. I don't think it's going to be the, the younger generation. It might be because we're actually going to act, pay the bill, right? But the, you know, the older generation who has, you know, it's going to have their benefits reduced. It's going to have their healthcare reduced. I mean, there's going to be major, major issues. Okay. There's opportunities there to provide services, to provide, you know, ways in which, you know, those, that generation can, can live uh, economically, right? So whether that's technology, whether that's a service oriented business, et cetera, but, you know, you have to look at what you can control. And I would say, you know, challenges and problems are just as much uh, things to be excited about than they are to be, to be afraid of. Uh, but, but in the end, I would say aware, awareness of the issue because the fear the fear that I have at, at, at least is, you know, the ignorance of the people, you know, always delegate the responsibility of making a choice, you know, to, to somebody who's deemed credible. And in most cases, it's going to be government because, you know, they, they supposedly know, know what to do. And hopefully there's enough momentum behind the awareness that they're the ones that created the problem, right? So that they're not, you know, the, right. the solvers of the, of the problem. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I think uh, the biggest challenge and roadblock to everything you just talked about is the fact that the media, when you look at the mainstream media, they are sending a message to young people that we need more government. Government is there to protect you. Uh, government is a safety net. I mean, I sound like Trump. I know he's always complaining about the media, but that's really true. If you watch CNN or MSNBC or you read Huffington Post or even more mainstream outlets like Politico, that's sort of the message that's underlying in most of their articles and, and, and um, clips. It, it's really it's terrifying. Um, this sort of notion that the government is there to take care of you. So I think that's the biggest roadblock to all of the solutions we've talked about. But I'm really hoping that with the diversification of media and online news, that that will be an easier narrative to break and to, to build up that awareness that we've been talking about and to show people in a bold, emotional, and effective way why this matters and why we all need to take action to protect ourselves and also, as you mentioned, to take advantages of new opportunities now instead of waiting. Well, I know you don't have, I know you don't have all day because this is, this is a fascinating conversation. We could probably you know, do this for, for a couple of hours uh, because the issues are so widespread and, you know, especially for the lens that, that you know, is interested by the, ca the causes and also potential uh, solutions. But thank you for writing your book. I mean, that it's, I know it's a, a uh, writing a book is a feat in and of itself, but then also on, on a topic that is, you know, I would say borderline co controversial, but very, very confusing to, to most, but also taking a stand for, you know, for more libertarian uh, and, and principles of, of liberty. Uh, because that's, you know, what I, and I'm not sure if Stossel is even on the air anymore. I haven't, I haven't seen much, much from him uh, lately, but it's, you know, it's, it's a message that's so needed. I think people really gravitate toward, but at the same time, you know, there has to be more, more there because it's definitely not the majority. Well, thank you so much. I, uh, I'm doing what little I can, but thank you as well for spreading the same kind of message of fiscal responsibility. I, I hope that uh, the ideas we discussed today will eventually be, you know, in the mainstream. And I would love for young people to kind of take a hold of this individualism and, and fiscal responsibility message and run with it. Because as you mentioned before, I love this sort of positive spin on it. You know, there are opportunities out there that are being created by this situation. And perhaps my generation will be the one to, to innovate and take advantage of that. Yep. They're the ones that have the most, I would say, most amazing minds based on how they've been raised, based on what they know how to do. It's just the application of, of that, uh, that I think will, will come. I mean, it has to, <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask you what, <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'm going to ask you one more, one more, uh, one more question and then we can, then we can, uh, we can part. What are, I, I'm curious to know who are the, the figures in whether it's government or media uh, that you, that you admire, or you try to, to emulate or follow, or you're, you're, in, you're positively influenced by? Well, I mean, 
the godfather of libertarianism and my personal hero is and will always be Ron Paul. Mm -hmm. I'm an unapologetic Paul bot. That's what we call (laughs) ourselves. And I always will be. I just love him. I think he did more for for free markets and libertarianism than anyone alive today. So I would say Ron Paul, number one. Uh, In the media, you know, I expose myself to all kinds of different things. I even like a lot of people on the left in the media. I think on the right, Bill O'Reilly is a very effective journalist. Mm -hmm. Say what you will about him. I mean, he was the king of cable. He had more eyeballs on him than anybody. I also watch MSNBC. I think Rachel Maddow is effective. Uh, I'm watching all of the uh, cable news channels constantly to kind of have my pulse on what the left and the right are thinking. Tucker Carlson has really taken cable by storm. So I look up to him because I think he's incredibly effective. I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's an effective TV journalist. Uh, And I'm also constantly reading books. So, um, you know, I love John Meacham. He wrote The Art of Power, which is a fantastic Thomas Jefferson biography, which sort of lays out the history of sort of what we consider today conservative thought. And I think uh, he's a, an interesting figure uh, in sort of chronicling the growth and progression of what we think of today as libertarian ideas. So he's someone I read. But in terms of watching on, on TV, I would say Tucker, uh, <laughs> Even like Don Lemon, Rachel Maddow. I mean, I'm all over the place. I like exposing myself to new ideas. Well, it's good you have that mindset because, you know, in in the end, there's nobody that has everything right. Uh, And there's elements of whether it's debate, elements of theory, elements of solution, you know, that both, both sides, everyone has, there's always something that's, that's good within what a person is thinking and saying, especially a person that has influence. Uh, so kudos for you for doing that. Cause I try to do the, the, the same thing. Uh, well, let's do, let's do this. What, what are ways that people can, can follow you, learn more about you? Uh, what's the best way to get the book too? So my book is called, how do I tax V it's available on Amazon or, you know, at normal bookstores. You can find me on Twitter at Kristen B Tate and Kristen is spelt with an I. So K R I S T I N B Tate. And my website is kristenbtate.com or thelibertarianchick.com. They'll both take you to the same place and you can find me there. Okay, awesome. And we'll, po- we'll post all of that on, uh, on show notes and, our, and our, social, our social media so we can help you get the word out. Thank you so much, Patrick. I love your show and it's an honor to be on. Thank you, Kristen. It was a great, uh, great conversation. Thanks for making the time. Of course. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us as the Wealth Standard Podcast spends all of 2018 celebrating life, liberty, and property. 